good morning, good evening, good afternoon to many people from joining from uh, various parts of the world from different time zones. OK, uh, so thank you for joining this session. We are going to have our view, our knowledge sharing with uh, AWS Cloud. But before that, uh, before that, we would like to do a little bit of that thing which was left over from the previous session, isn't it? Like we were we were stuck at pushing our changes to the GitHub repository. Do you remember if you had followed the first I mean the first week with the DevOps introduction, you might have you could recall that there is a site site hiccup and then we will like because I, I just forgot the password. So let me go. And do the push so. You know, I will go to my. You uh, you are familiar with this. This is the Git bash, which is sort of a Linux thing where we were doing all this. So can you see the screen? I am I I'm the I'm there on my Git folder, which is uh, the DevOps one, and I'm in the master branch. I had already committed few of the files onto my local repository. Okay. So let's say uh, you were just to uh, to have a, a recap of what we did is uh, you know the local repository the local repo this is our laptop um, for windows or for mac okay from there uh, from this local repository we have made some changes isn't it we had made several changes over here like uh, then we have added and we have added the changes and we have committed committed the changes now this is the stage we are ready for push push where push to our github so let's say this is our uh, remote machine remote machine on somewhere on the internet called the github this is the server okay this is where we are going to push let's see that i will just uh what i will do is Before I go here, I must know that there is, uh, if I say git remote minus v, you have this particular remote repository where we are going to push it, where we are going to push the changes. Now, what we do is also to know what is the state of our status. So git status, you will see that nothing is there to be further committed to the master branch of the local repository. Is that fine? Right, do you agree? And if I say git log and I would like to have a one liner of the logs, then you will see that there is uh, this is the origin master, which is a few commits behind the local local is this one. The green one is the local. The master is few commits behind. So it is an ideal situation where we can put in our changes from here to the remote. Let me before that, let me go over there. You see this, this is my repository, remote repository, and we do not have anything, okay? Or it's empty other than the readme file on the main, on the main branch. So let us see. Uh, if we can push and if you if you can see the config is already there. The config is there, so I am having this this account. This is the email ID. And of course there is a password which not which will not be displayed over here and the remote origin is this one the. One. Where I'm going to put in so git push. Origin 
And in the origin, which branch? It didn't have the master branch. So let's put pick this uh, pick this one up from the local repository and put that into the master into the GitHub. Let's do it. So similarly, it is asking for the account name. So I know. Let me let me do it slowly. Devash is Jeff. And I like to copy this one. Let's see if it works this time. Mm. The password has been removed. So let me bring that. I think this was one. Or let me go into this. What I'll do, I will go into this one and quickly set up my password. Go to the settings. I will go to the developer settings. This is the entire settings of my account. OK, I will like to create one personal access token very quickly and I will go to the tokens classic and uh, let me generate a new token. OK. And I will go for the generating a new token in the classic version. So let me say uh, my token. For DevOps. One. Any name that you can give, I would like to give a 30 days expiration. That is fine. And I will give, I will say the select scopes. I would like to write and delete and admin. I have these scopes. That is, these are the privileges with this particular password. I'm sort of giving everything without any filtration. Uh, this is just to get that push done. Okay, so I'm giving basically everything. Yeah, so what I did, I. Uh, did all the scopes of this privilege and I will generate a token. Now I will quickly copy this. This is the token which was generated and I will put it over here. So that I do not forget it because this will be generated only one time. OK, and uh, once I do that, I can go back to my. to my repository, this one, isn't it? That is my repository. OK, there is uh, the main branch, OK? And now I will go back to my this thing. I will make an, a further attempt with the git push. Let's see. Git push. Origin master. So Debashish GIF is my account. And just now I have copied. Let's see whether it can help me. Oh, yes. Uh, yes. So this time, uh, because of my uh, issue that I have resolved, I have generated a new, you know, uh, personal access token. It is called personal access token with this or it is called PAT. Uh, sorry, it is called PAT and with the help of which I am being able to. Push my changes because that it needs an authentication so that without a personal access token, you will not be authenticated to push anything because you cannot push in whatever you like because it's somebody else account. You have to know the account personal access token. With this, I now verify what happened over here. OK, the master it has given a master had a recent pushes one second back. One second back it has a push. So what I do, I will see that there is a master branch. It was originally with the main branch, then it will have a master branch. And what we do is, can you see all these files which were there on my local system? Uh, I, if I go there, I will see LL. 
or you can say ls minus l. You see, these are the files into my current folder DevOps one, which we have created. Remember, as if these are the Java files or Python files or whatever the files. Uh, uh, it could be image files, it could be video files, it could be uh, whatever files you you may think. It can be an HTML file, it can be a CSS file. Any changes that you have done on a, on your local repository, you have pushed it to your master. Or maybe if you wanted to push it to your uh, created branch, you can do that. So isn't it nice that your files have now been reposited onto a remote repository? This is somewhere on the Internet with some account. You can verify my third file. My third file is having this is this is one line we have just just to understand this topic. OK, so if you go there and say VI my third file, you will see the same thing. This is my third file, my third file and is exactly the same. Clear? So I think whatever little we have discussed over uh, uh, on the previous weekend, that is with the with the introduction to DevOps and with some hands on with Git, I think we can switch over to our new topic today for this weekend, which is uh, AWS Cloud. Is that fine? Any questions? Can you see the screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Very good. And so we are going to this fantastic topic called AWS Cloud, Amazon Cloud or Web Services. Let me uh, open the slide screen. So we are going to understand a bit of. We are going to discuss about Amazon Web Services, which is a very, very important understanding if we want to go further into our DevOps knowledge, because DevOps is entirely I mean, most of the tools, all the all of the tools and whenever you work in an organization, they will be working on a platform which is maybe in on premises, doesn't matter, but it will have Linux. OK, as the server software or the operating system, and mostly they will be hosting their servers and their platform over onto a cloud. And the most popular cloud among all the clouds available in the market today is of course, Amazon Web Services or Amazon Cloud, which is which we in short is called AWS. I think all of you have. Definitely have gone through that uh, there is the most famous AWS Cloud. Let us go it uh, a bit of details inside it. Uh, you may be ready with your questions, but uh, it will be better if I can take your questions only after we had. Um, in the designated question and answer session. OK, is that fine? In, in, but if there is immediately some questions that is very much haunting your, uh, I mean, you are restless with that particular question, please, please shout. No issues. Now, what is cloud computing? I hope the, uh, the screen is very clear to you. OK. Now, in a very simple word, in very this, these are the definitions that we have picked up from uh, Amazon itself. So Amazon is say, uh, defining cloud is the what is the on demand delivery of IT resources. Now you know most of the earlier clients or the clients or the customers were uh, were having their own data centers, their on prem premise infrastructure, isn't it? So they would be investing a lot of money. Uh, what you say the capex, you know, the capex and the opex. Opex is the for the operational whatever investments they do for the day to day operations, and the capex is the one time investment, and they can have several investments, but they are capex, which is the capital investment, capital capital expenditure, for for acquiring a big uh, big server, a big infrastructure for the servers, the network the storage, so many, uh, so many things that the, there is needed for an IT infrastructure. But nowadays with the advent of cloud and with this services coming up uh, like you manage services over the cloud, cloud is providing these companies, these big uh, 
companies or medium sized companies the option to go to the cloud to get all the IT resource services from the cloud. So you do not need to um, invest on your own infrastructure. Let us get it hired from the cloud platform itself because cloud has everything ready. Whatever you need, whatever you ask for, it is there for you. So and and the most important thing is it is in the capex. What happens in the capex? You 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 invest on a fixed amount and that fixed amount will be uh, growing day by day uh, or rather every year you have to give an annual maintenance fees for those engineers and for those uh, companies who had provided with that infrastructure. So it's a huge amount of investment, you know, not only on the first year of the um, capital investment, but it can go. It can it will be recurring every year. Whereas while you have given everything uh, on to AWS, you pay as you go pricing. That is the most lucrative part of it. That means you say, I will pay only for what I use. Isn't it fantastic concept? So you use servers, you use uh, a large memory, a hard disk, a, a big network. All these things are fine. You use it. Nobody is asking you, and you get it on the fly. But what happens is you only pay for what you what you use. You should not pay. See, when you make a capital investment over your infrastructure, what happens is whether you use or not, you may be using only 20% of your entire capacity. But what you do is you are you have you are using it. I mean, you have already paid for it. Whether you use or not, uh, you had already invested. Whereas here, it is like elastic. It is very elastic. You can stretch it. You can relax it. So there is an ex expansion and there is a, a compression. So as your need goes up, your usage goes up. As your need comes down, your usage comes down. So um, the question is whether even when you are not using, are you paying? You are paying when you are doing it on premises or you, if you have your own data centers, but not when you have given it to over the cloud. OK. So this is a boon in in disguise. So instead of buying, owning and maintaining a physical data center and servers, you can access technology services such as computing power, storage, databases, as and when you need on a need basis from a cloud prov uh, provider like Amazon Web Services. Is the definition more or less clear? Suppose uh, people who are just hearing the. Uh, going into the technology for the first time. So there is somebody on the cloud sitting somewhere behind the scene providing you all the services with whatever you demand that is on demand services. OK, the services could be for your IT infrastructure, your network, your storage, your computing, whatever you need. It is provided there even for the applications, application support. Now everything is there for you and you use it and pay as you go. And there are various pricing uh, slabs, you know, you can select out of it, whichever suits you, whichever is more pocket saving for you, you go for it. The cloud does not differentiate on the basis of how much and how long it will provide the service based on the pay, pay package that you opt for. No. It is very democratic in that respect. You know, it, it will it will not stop suspend your uh, services because uh, you have gone for a lower package. No, no. The services, the quality of the services are not compromised. The availability of the services are always there. Anyway, now who is using cloud computing? That is the next question, isn't it? Now, organizations of every type, size. So whether it's a big organization, uh, big five, or it is a medium-sized or a small-sized, uh, a new 
entrepreneurship uh, organization, a new, uh, you know, say a new setup. So any type, any size, and from any industry can be the user of cloud for a wide variety of use cases, such that some, some companies would like to have only the cloud services for the data, uh, data backup. Data is a big, big headache for any company to maintain, to have the integrity, to securely store it without the data leakage and all the stuff, information leakage, because information is a very sensitive part of any uh, computing. So maybe a company is needing the cloud services only for the data backup. Or maybe they want a disaster recovery or they want only the email services provided over the cloud. They might need the virtual uh, machines, instances, the desktops, software development and testing, big data analytics, customer facing web applications. Now, there are so many kinds of use cases. For example, healthcare companies are using the cloud to develop more personalized treatments for patients. OK. So you are at home, you cannot move into a hospital. But will that services be only restricted to uh, once you visit a hospital physically and you meet the doctor physically, uh, only then the service will be provided? No. Cloud says you be at your home. We will make every healthcare services available to you at your home, at your doorstep. So financial services companies are using the cloud to uh, to power real time fraud detection and prevention. So because they are financial services company and they have lots of responsibilities of providing a good service to the to the customer without the fear of fraud and uh, hacking or whatever you say. And there can be video game makers. Uh, they are also using there. There can be lots of use cases. Let's go, uh, move ahead now. You can see there are the benefits of cloud computing. Can you see the screen? There are five, the four big benefits, the most important benefits. One is the agility. The agility, oh, agility means you, the speed that you want for your delivery deployment. The cloud, you, you see, you are as if you are making a sprint. The cloud gives you easy access to broad range of technologies so that you can innovate faster and build nearly anything that you can imagine. OK. There is no uh, there is no end. You can quickly spin up resources as you need them for from infrastructure services as li like earlier days. If you are uh, maybe you are very new to IT industry, but uh, since we are very experienced, we have seen those time when uh, you wanted a server to for the for the development team where the development should start for a project and the it infrastructure team will deliver that uh, that hardware that hardware resource along with the installation of the of your operating system along with say maybe the database that you want so let's say oracle so this installation of oracle as well as your operating system on top of a a freshly provisioned hardware which will take not not less than 20 to 25 days earlier we had experience and the more bigger the server the more bigger the infrastructure the more the time taken for that but here i can i can assure you within not even it will take half an hour that you can deliver your server along with the installation of uh, operating system. If that operating system can be a big, big operating system uh, like Linux. And on top of it, you will have Oracle or Java, whatever you want. It will not take you more than 20 to 30 minutes. That is a guarantee. So it is not only getting a provision, some uh, hardware or network infrastructure. It is also uh, the, the same agility is applied when you deploy your uh, technological services or your applications over the net to your uh, to your client or to the market just in time delivery you know jit from the japanese technology that is the japanese have invented this jit 
just in time delivery when the customer needs it be there in the market if the customer needs it now and you deliver the product say after a week there is no value because in the meantime somebody else has already delivered that feature or that particular product so you must be always ready to be delivered as and when it is asked and for that you need some technology some support and the cloud will give you that agility support elasticity elasticity is one of the another very very important term okay so what do you mean by elasticity can anyone please um, find out why we say elasticity what is elasticity you know you have learned physics okay you know elasticity is uh, the the capacity to go beyond a particular limit but yeah and then you can release it so it will come back to the normal uh, resilience point you can stretch it stretch a thing up to the point where it cannot break and then when you release it will come to where your normal so it is it is the same thing with the cloud computing you don't have to over provision resources see in a capex you do not you had got an estimate that it will need uh, some some terabytes of uh, storage some huge network infrastructure uh, some huge big machine big server and for that you do it one time and you invest a lot of money but here with the cloud you just go you do not go overboard with the investment you just need to use the resources which are just needed that's all optimum use of resources so when you when your need grows it will elastically provide you that uh, additional whatever the resources that you need to sustain that need but whenever that need does not happen or uh, it will automatically uh, downsize the resources requirement so this upsizing and downsizing happens automatically and that is provided fantastically over the cloud and that is called elasticity whenever you learn aws aws most of the features of aws will be with elastic elastic some feature with a with a prefix called elastic we are going to come to that so you you, you can scale these resources up upscale or downscale to instantly grow and shrink the capacity as your business needs change clear now cost savings this is one one of the most important part and why the big organizations are moving into it because the cost cutting the cost savings are one of the prior priorities of any organization okay the cloud allows you to trade fixed expenses fixed expenses such as data centers and physical servers for variable expenses i do not need to maintain a data center and a physical servers what happens when when there is a flood you ne never know uh, and is the, in bombay there can be a big data center in mumbai of india there can be a big data but it happened one day uh, once that with the flood in mumbai the data center or the, all the data all the all the servers and everything got a huge impact it took days to recover the data the lost data or to replicate the data from this uh, the data center to the other data center so this is quite a hazard you have spent millions and millions of dollars over this da data center and one in once natural calamity with one failure of uh, you know your normal expectation uh, everything gets wiped out so why don't you put those all the investments over the cloud and it could be a very very uh, affordable expense variable expense you know and you only pay for the it as you consume it you consume it whatever you have provisioned you have not provision you have not consumed the entire 100% if you have consumed only 20% of it just pay for 20% plus the variable expenses are much lower than what you would pay to do it yourself because of the economics of scale 
you the economies of scale is provided by the uh, the cloud provider that is amazon aws you do not need to manage the economies uh, economies of scale it's a big term the companies are uh, very, very worried about this. They are all concerned about this economies of scale. And if you can manage this, only your revenues will grow. If you cannot manage this uh, prudently, uh, revenues are you are going to be get, get, getting on the losses side on the other side. Deploy globally in minutes. That is what we have already discussed with the cloud. You can expand to new geographic regions and deploy globally in minutes. That means you do not need to be your the world is your global village. You, you sit in Kolkata or Mumbai or Hyderabad, wherever Chennai, OK, and you can directly work over a server. Over the cloud in US. Or in Japan. So there is no boundary. Geographically, there is no boundary. So AWS has divided into regions and sub regions, you know, availability zones. It's a very fantastic way of uh, dealing with. Uh, as a global company, you need to have your footprint all over the world without any delay. For example, AWS has infrastructure all over the world. Yes, so you can deploy your application in multiple physical locations with just a few clicks. Uh, that is a big advantage. OK, putting applications in closer proximity to end users reduces latency and improves their experience. So if you are uh, catering to Indian users uh, and if you can get your applications more closer to India, like let, let's say in Mumbai where AWS has a uh, AWS region, OK? So the latency will reduce. Uh, it is uh, over the naked eyes and over the you will not understand the difference. But yes, technologically you can be much more faster. Your network response will be much better if you are in the closer proximity of your. Uh, the client. Now, now this is you, you see the Amazon Web Services. There are this is a very nice picture. If you can think of you start from the physical layer. That is that is how AWS is providing the global infrastructure. It has divided the entire world or entire globe into several regions. And each region will be divided into availability zones through the subnets. You know there is this is where the VPC virtual private cloud is there and that virtual private cloud is again divided into subnets for the better management of the resources. So you do not. Uh, you have divided your region. Let's say this is in Mumbai. Or this is in uh, Ohio of US. OK, in Ohio again, there will be several data centers or subnets sub networking zones are called availability zones. So it is like better administration. Why? Why did we divide our country into several states? What is the answer? Why a big state or a big country like India is divided into 28 states and several uh, union ter territories? Can you can you tell me? It is because of better governance better administration. OK, so similarly, if you have to have managed the data uh, quite. Uh, nicely and distribute it, it quite evenly, so you divide the, the big region into availability zones. And these are the age locations. Anyway. So when we learn the uh, DevOps, uh, sorry, cloud, we learn the foundation services of AWS. This is the base. You must learn this before you go to the further uh, part. What are this? The foundation services. We are also going to learn this is the Amazon EC2 compute services. The computational part of it that is that is you are 
provisioning uh, a server. You are creating a server, OK? And then you are also doing some auto scaling. Auto scaling means you are scaling up, scaling down according to the resources the requirement. So this is the computing part. So you can say that I can provision a big server. I can provision a medium sized server. I can provision a, a, a small server for my need. OK, so this part comes under. So EC2, you can see. Elastic cloud computing. This E stands for elastic. So you are creating an instance which is elastic, which can scale up and down. Compute cloud computing C2. There are two C's. So that is when you create your service. This is a service. EC2 is a service provided by Amazon. So with the help of EC2 service, you can provision your network, your uh, I mean, you can use your network. Uh, you can use your security group. You can use your key pair to create and and of course your operating system. You will be able to provision your. Uh, your instance, the hardware, the server, you can see. And again, in the storage services, you have several storage services. I have listed, uh, we have listed few of them. And out of this, Amazon S3 is the most popular and most commonly used, a very popular uh, service provided by AWS, which is called Simple Storage Service S3. There are three S's. Amazon will always go for some uh, short names. So S simple storage service S3. Amazon, uh, this is a very popular service. Then there is another popular service called EBS, elastic. Again, the elastic comes block storage. Elastic block storage. Then there is the storage gateway. There is a, like we have discussed that if a company only wants some storage services uh, from uh, the cloud, then they can go for AWS storage gateway. They, they might not need this service or this database service or networking service or content distribution service. So these are all services. They want only maybe the storage gateway. They can go for it. So that is what you do not need to go for Amazon for all. The, if you want to need only this particular service, you pay for it. Though Amazon is going to give you everything, but you are using this only, so you pay only for this service. That's all. Otherwise, earlier days, the concept was if you had to go for an application or for some software, you have to pay for the entire price, for that entire enterprise price. But here, you just pay for whatever you use, whichever service that you use. Even for database, you will have Amazon RDS, so, so for Relational Database Management System or RDBMS or RDS, Relational Database Services provided by Amazon over the cloud. So that means these are all managed services. You see, you have to have a little bit of knowledge on the SQLs of the Relational Database. Otherwise, uh, you have your design, but the the, the entire services will be provided by Amazon. The security part, the availability, making it run for 24 by 7 for all the 20, uh, 30 days and all the 365 days. This availability, this uh, se securing your data, the integrity of the data, everything will be managed by you do not need to worry about the health of the of the database. That managed service will be provided like if your company is using no SQL database like Mongo database, MongoDB. You, uh, you, I think you have heard. MongoDB is uh, is not a relational database. It is a no SQL database. If you want to have that same thing over over the network, uh, I mean over the cloud, you can go for Amazon service for DynamoDB. This Elastic Cache is also a database for your uh, elastic cache it is only for your fast uh, i mean search why do we create database 
it is something which you can query very fast in a very organized manner. Similarly, here, if you have some unorganized data, okay, you can use Elastic Cache to search through the organized data. That means through um, millions and millions of messages, you want to pick up some structured data out of it and query it. Uh, then there is the networking. So Amazon will provide you the networking services like the VPC, virtual private cloud. Amazon is going to give you the elastic load balancing. Again, elastic. That means you can balance the load of your uh, traffic, which is requesting your services, the application services. You can distribute that load using an elastic load balancer in between. And that elastic load balancer is a service provided by Amazon. Amazon uh, Route 53 and Amazon Direct Connect, these are all networking services. If you are not an application developer, you might not be interested with these services provided by Amazon. Like the Amazon will provide you the uh, Amazon Cloud Front. So you can, it's a content distribution. The technology <coughs> for making your content distribution, uh, it's a cakewalk with the with the managed services like amazon cloudfront you have uh, you can manage your messaging the application because messaging is a very important part of any application development but you can have amazon sns amazon sqs and amazon ses managing your services for the your application then there is amazon search the cloud search for quick queries and quick uh, searching over the over the cloud, over the, your application cloud. This is the distributed computing with the help of Lambda, you know, Lambda computing. Then these are the libraries, SDKs, software development toolkits, uh, Java, Python, all this support for all these libraries are provided with application platform services. Then we come to the, yeah, this part is only if you are app absolutely an application developer. But for a DevOps engineer, you might very well understand, you need to understand this part and this part. If you are an operations guy, you are definitely going to understand the Amazon CloudWatch. Okay? Uh, you, whatever you do over the uh, GUI, that is the graphical user interface, is with the Amazon Management Console. Amazon will provide you a graphical interface through which you can manage, you can uh, implement these services, all these services. OK, you can initiate these services. And also you have a fantastic thing uh, with the with the control, like you should not allow all the users of your uh, of, of a cloud should not be having all the privileges. So uh, you should differentiate between Tom Harry and whoever. They should not, based on their role, you must create the privileges and accesses to them. Because uh, see, cloud resources are not meant to be accessed all over across all the functions. They need to be, uh, you have to maintain the sanctity of the access. So you should not give an authentication to anyone to uh, fiddle with or to you know, to do anything with any of the resources because those resources, every time that there will be a billing. If you, so if you wrongly use or um, if your usage is not correct and up to the expectation of your company, then you may end up, your company may end up paying extra bill and see everything is audited. So you will not be able to hide yourself if you are. So wh why don't you do in the very beginning that you provide the specific roles and access to the specific users. And that is done through the identity and access management. It is called IAM, a very important feature or service provided by Amazon. Deployment and automation. We will have some uh, one slide for AWS Elastic, again Elastic Binstock. How nicely you can deploy your application. Okay, 
without without understanding without uh, i mean without a concern of uh, what are what is the infrastructure what is the environment that you need everything will be provided provided by this bin stock uh, service of aws now you have sorry sorry uh, you also have a cloud formation cloud formation is another thing that you can deploy your like you have done this ec2 or you have created your s3 or you you have created your amazon uh, rds that is through this amazon um, management console you can do that but you can also do it with a script you can code your infrastructure and you can run your infrastructure without getting any help from the AWS Management Console. You can create a script that is automatically, you are doing some automation, provisioning automation. You can create your EC2 instance. You can create your <coughs> uh, S3 bucket. Okay, you can create your Amazon VPC. You can create your networking elements. You can create your subnets. Now, all these things can be done over cloud formation. This is one, one very important service of, of cloud. Next week, we are going to learn Terraform. Now, Terraform is also going to create resources on AWS, but from outside, not using the Amazon Management Console. The concept is similar to cloud formation, but cloud formation is a bit costly service provided by Amazon because it is automation. So therefore we can use Terraform. It depends on your in your customer, whether they will go for cloud formation, AWS cloud formation service, or they want to go through Terraform. Terraform is much more versatile than cloud formation, of course. We will learn that. And Amazon CloudWatch, as we have said, that for the operations guy, they need to keep on monitoring 24 by seven on the product on the product uh, on the product which has been deployed over the production okay so cloud watch is one of the amazon services like if you say nagios nagios is not an amazon service but it is going to give you the similar functionality of amazon cloud watch so why if you have gone for aws so you may decide your company may, may decide that we don't want to go for nagios we will better use a managed service like Amazon CloudWatch. Is that clear? For monitoring and this operation guy will use Amazon CloudWatch managed service for monitoring the health of the production system. Now, cloud computing models, we, we you can go through this. It is the infrastructure as a service. There is a cloud computing model, types of cloud computing that we do. OK, uh, infrastructure as a service. I have a very nice uh, diagram. Then you will understand the infrastructure as a service, sometimes abbreviated as IAAS. You might be hearing these terms quite a lot nowadays. You say I am using IAAS. You have to know about all these things. Otherwise, it will be very difficult to first of all, to get a job to maintain a job. And also, even if you are a manager, OK, you need to be aware of these terms because otherwise you will not be able to uh, contribute anything over a meeting or uh, with your project team. You should know, understand this IAAS. Infrastructure as a service. Then there is pass platform as a service. And there is the ultimate. The SaaS. S A A S software as a service. So naturally, you know that infrastructure, you have something to do with this if you go for infrastructure as a service, uh, as a cloud computing model. Uh, you have to do a little bit less work than infrastructure as a service if you go for platform as a service. And you have to do nothing, basically. Everything will be managed by uh, the provider of that service. It's called software as a service. We will have a diagram. Infrastructure as a service, sometimes abbreviated as IES, contains the basic building blocks and cloud IT and typically provide access to networking features, computers, and data storage space. So everything is like uh, virtual, 
but you have to provision them. OK, so that is called infrastructure as a service. You are doing. Uh, you are coding the infrastructure. You can say you are writing some scripts to create your infrastructure, but still you have to do something. Platform as a service. Platform as a service remove the need for organizations to manage the underlying infrastructure. See, if you had created your infrastructure, it is you who is responsible for maintaining them. Whether it is the servers that you have provisioned or the uh, or the network or the storage, whatever, whatever you name it, you can create that infrastructure with the help of uh, cloud and services. Uh, but still you have to maintain it, whereas with a platform as a service, you do not need to manage uh, the underlying infrastructure. Uh, usually the hardware and the operating system, and that will allow you to focus on the de deployment. And management of your application, so what you do. How the infrastructure is managed is not your concern. You focus on the what part. What? What is more important than how? You must know what is to be done. What is needed? And the how part, that is how things are getting done in the background, you leave it on platform as a service. OK? Software as a service. And that, that is the ultimate. So you can understand that this service is cost wise, it is more uh, affordable. This is a bit costly and this is the most costly part of the service that if you if you go for it, but many companies are finding this is much more easier than to invest so many um, cost. I mean, there, there will be a lot of cost otherwise. So this ultimately proves to be beneficial or profitable for organizations. They want to save a huge amount of money so they can go for software as a service. Why? Because software as a service provider provides you with a completed product. That is run. And managed by the service provider, you do not need to do anything. In most cases, people referring to software as a service are referring to end user applications. Yeah. With SAAS offering, you do not have to think about how the service is maintained or how the underlying infrastructure is managed. You only need to think about how you will use that particular piece of software. So basically. You think of the end product and how it is going to be distributed and getting available with your clients. So a common example of SaaS application is web based email where you can send and receive email without having to manage the features. So you do not need to know what is happening in the background, how a mail goes from one party to the other party. OK. You just. You do the, the the application part of it. That's all. As I said, it is. These are all taken from the cloud. I mean AWS. So these are from the AWS documentation. OK. You can go through this the same. The same infrastructure, uh, the same uh, details for IAS, PaaS and SaaS. Now, if you go through this, you will understand the basic differences. Let's say here you have not you are not using any cloud services. You are as if uh, the old customers who had their own data centers or their own setup of uh, the on premises. Uh, your the the network, the storage, the servers. The virtualizations, OS, middleware, runtime, data, applications, everything. Your you are the owner. You manage. You paid for all these services, or rather, you have built up your data center with all this uh, hardware and software. You you basically manage them on premise. It's a huge amount of investment needed. OK, now you decide your company has decided that you will go over to the infrastructure as a service. You are uh, you are really not being able to manage everything on your own. You uh, uh, you are able to manage, but then you are at you are managing at the expense of at the cost of a huge expense. Because the the human part of it is quite costly. 
So what you do? You say that. The blue ones are the things I will manage. The company will manage like what the operating system, the middleware, the runtime, the data and the applications. See, data is one thing that the company does not want to give it to the service provider. Because data is the most sensitive part. Uh, the company can be legally penalized for any leakage of data. So data is the last thing that the company wants uh, to be maintained by a third party or from the service providers. So they think that I will manage this and OK. So if that is so, then we go for infrastructure as a service. So what is that? We give it to uh, some other vendor or rather service provider, the cloud service provider for networking, storage, servers and virtualization. This will be done by uh, if we take the AWS services for this, that's OK. Now we come to platform as a service. So what we do is we only keep the blue part applications and data with us. We will manage this application, our application, our data. I will not give it to the uh, to the service provider. But the rest, the networking, storage, servers, virtualization, OS, middleware, runtime, all this will now be managed by the, the service provider, the cloud service provider. Uh, uh, it's a one-way traffic. So, um, are you understanding? If I if you if I can get a yes or no, something like that, some response. It's I know it's a not a very interesting topic, but it's a very important topic. Yes. OK, great, great. Thank you. So software as a service. Now you decided that oh, enough, enough is enough. I am not being able to manage the data. And even if I do, uh, there is still leakage. I'm not being able to securely keep my data with me. So what's the use? I'm paying a huge amount of money. But still, I'm not being able to secure my data. It is still somehow getting hacked, somehow getting leaked. Somehow my applications are uh, performing not well. Uh, they are uh, day by day. They are the performance has degre degraded. So what I decide the finally the company has given up, said that OK, my customers are not very happy. So what you do? AWS, Amazon, please take the entire thing from me and you manage everything. I will pay you. But also this payment, all this, uh, these charges are quite less than if you think of this one or this one. Maybe, maybe they are definitely going to pay a bit more than platform as a service definitely because now the applications are data is also responsibility of the of the cloud provider. So entire these gray areas are actually your gray areas, right? right? Or your company's gray areas, which they were not being able to manage or uh, maintain. So the entire thing comes. This is only possible. Uh, I will not go for any other cloud. I will go for a cloud which can definitely is a renowned one who has proven track record to manage everything like this. So I can easily go for AWS. Clear? EC2, a virtual server in AWS. You can create your EC2 is the basic fundamental. EC2 is the elastic cloud compute cloud, or you can say elastic cloud compute, whatever it is. EC2 is the basic fundamental block around which the AWS is structured. You will create your own server. And that server is, if it is on the Amazon cloud, it will be called elastic cloud computing, CC. EC2 provides remote operations of virtual machines on Amazon's infrastructure. A single VM is called an instance. Virtual machine, this is all, all whatever you do on the cloud is virtual. So that is uh, an instance. And there are different instance types that differ in their available resources. So you can create a big instance, you can create a medium uh, sized instance or a low or a micro instance. 
a micro instance is the only EC2 instance that is free. Uh, there is a free tier concept. That means for 12 months, for the after you have created your, created your account on EW, uh, AWS, uh, your account is on a free tier. So one of the instance, not not a big one, but yes, it is good for your learning. You can start working on AWS by creating a micro instance, and that is absolutely free. That is one of the important features of uh, AWS. You know, it will give you many things for free for the first 12 months. Okay. I'm sorry. Amazon machine images. Now everything is an image, you know. <clears throat> sorry. You. Uh, you uh, you package your application, a big application like you have developed it in on on Java or Python or PHP or whatever you mention. It's a big software, okay, that you have developed. But then how will you deploy it? Uh, it is not early days. Earlier days, you have to take a lot of deployment strategy. It will take uh, you months to deploy. Uh, maybe a month to deploy a very complicated application. And nowadays what you do within minutes you deploy Amazon, Amazon itself, Amazon uh, that e-commerce site, you know how many how many uh, deployments they do over over a day. Basically every 16 minutes <coughs> they can do one uh, one deployment a very complex deployment they don't need much much time not not even a day because they can package their entire service or application into an image and that is what we have to learn in devops the containerization with a containerization technology like with docker and kubernetes you can very well deploy very well deploy the uh, this thing, your applications over an image. OK. So now that is. Uh, you will say that, OK, I have I have provisioned my EC2 instance. Uh, how will I how will I create a an operating system? How will I if you buy a lap, laptop and if you do not get an operating system, will you be able to operate that laptop? Never. Laptop is just a hardware piece. It's a it's a, your laptop. OK, but it cannot. It's a dumb box otherwise, but you need to have an operating system. An operating system uh, now you have to the vendor can um, uh, install the operating system or you can uh, install the operating system like Mac or Windows. It, it, it may take you days. But finally you will be uh, successful, but here within few minutes you just get an image of the operating system it can be a big operating system like red hat linux or ubuntu linux or amazon uh, linux or sushi or you name it fedora centos these are big os operating system in the linux in, in the linux world linux is you have to have uh, have a knowledge of Linux, otherwise you will not be able to survive in the IT industry. And especially if you want to be a DevOps engineer, you must go for understanding of Linux. And uh, and this machine image AMI Amazon machine image of Linux will be just attached to it. That is the technology, the beauty of it. You do not need to install it. It will be attached to your instance while the instance is getting created so an instance will be created ec2 instance will be created along with the uh, machine image of the operating system okay so those that comes as a package or as an image bundle as an image the entire software will come bundle as an image and you will deploy your application as an image everything that is why we need to know this automation and how do you do it orchestration how do you do it with uh, docker and kubernetes 
as we said elastic block store is another it's a part of the storage you know we were just going uh, if you had a look at that particular thing that it is part of that storage service elastic block store it's a block level storage it's a sort of a volume ebs volumes are network attached and persist independently for the from the life of an instance okay so in this ebs volume will be attached again this is like an object it is like an object everything is an object uh, a service over on the cloud you can attach this ebs volume of whatever size maybe it's a 8 gb or 20 gb or 100 gb you attach it to your ec2 instance once you do that once you do that your 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 size of the storage is determined while you create your ec2 instance okay it can it can the storage volume can range from 1 gb to 1 terabyte 1 gigabyte to 1 terabyte so in one attachment you can attach 1 terabyte of storage to your server and also this is a snapshot i think you understand what is a snapshot ebs provides the ability to backup point in time snapshots of your data to s3 now s3 is, as i said is a simple storage service now that is a storage service provided by amazon and the instance can go uh, can can crash you know though there is almost a zero possibility of that because amazon is maintaining your managing your ec2 instance so there is no question of it but then but still you may need a, a backup point in snapshot this snapshot that means some some application you have deployed on your ec2 instance but before deploying that application you might think that this application might not go correctly so i need to have a backup point that means whatever was running before uh, installing this application should can be restored i can roll it back to the previous point if the current installation or current system does not work it's a very very important i mean you know so that the image of that point in time whatever was there with that ec2 instance how it was running that journaling will be stored into your s3 suppose something has gone wrong so sir your server is not booting up because of the new application that's gone in so what you do you retrieve your ec2 instance at that point where you have taken that snapshot so you will retrieve that snapshot and your system is back again you are you are saved of a big misery otherwise you could have been sacked you know this this can these are very serious uh, i mean goof ups if you if you I, if i am allowed to mention that word that means you need to be responsible of the data of the um, the system and if you do not do some something which can retrieve something can go wrong see it industry is always a possibility of something going wrong anywhere anytime isn't it so we may this EBS will give you a provision of uh, uh, the snapshots. You can take incremental backups. Okay. This is a very beautiful feature. Simple storage service, as we have just told you, this is one of the most popular services available with Amazon. S3 is a minimalistic data hosting service. Storing data and downloading data in S3 are built separately. Okay. Oh, yeah, that is that billing is different thing uh, as you use the S3. But S3 is a safe and secure place uh, over the cloud provided by AWS. So where you can store your source code, your data, important data, your images, your whatever you say. And at any point of time, you can retrieve that those photos, those images, those uh, source data. So many, many application houses use S3 as their uh, storage service. 
elastic load balancer. Okay. So uh, I will just go a bit faster. So uh, I, I thought I would uh, make a diagram of it, but it's okay. Uh, you will understand. Say, let's say you have created lots of in instances. There are say five instances. Five instances means EC2 instances servers. Your application is distributed over the five, inst uh, five you know, instances servers. And it is not necessary that those servers are only uh, in a particular region, in a particular availability zone. And we, within that region also, they, there can be uh, distributed over the several availability zones to, to spread away the load, the spread, to spread, out, spread out the load evenly. Now, and this can happen cross region, this distribution of the load. Now, what happens when there is a huge traffic coming in for accessing your application distributed over the availability zones. Can it you, your you do not you do not know you are the end users. You are coming from outside. How will you know which particular instance at that point of time is having lesser amount of load? Such that your query is diverted to that uh, particular machine or that particular virtual machine or instance. You do not know you have no way to know that. So why do you why don't we do one thing we install an elastic load balancer which is also maybe a server or an instance but a service installed over there which is called elastic load balancer so elastically that so all the request will come and hit the elastic load balancer and elastic load balancer will have an algorithm it can find out which of the various available uh, EC2 instances will be available or having a lesser load at that point of time? Are you getting me? So it will di it will direct the divert the traffic to that particular instance where the load is quite less or manageable. So out of five instances that you have running the same application, one of the uh, servers or one of the servers is having a bit less uh, load than the other four servers. So what what it will do? It will divert that uh, direct that particular traffic over to that particular instance. And that is the beauty of this elastic load balancer. We will in our uh, main course of uh, AWS cloud, we will understand this in a bit more details and with a practical demonstration of how this thing load gets balanced and distributed over the various instances. As I said, this is elastic load balancer, the details of it. Okay, ELB, the elastic load balancer uses case. An elastic load balancer can take incoming EKS data uh, this is a Kubernetes, elastic Kubernetes data. Uh, so that is a Kubernetes. We will not know at this moment what is Kubernetes, but let's say that is some um, a huge traffic coming from some cluster of network. Okay, so to access your application. So what will uh, the elastic load balancer will pick pick up this incoming request? and route it to one of the several listener instances who can process the data or submit it to the database. So it will pick up that particular listener where it can uh, do it. So this is one use case. If one instance is receiving too much of traffic, the ELB will try to, this is the, uh, the activity that the ELB is going to do to take the request from the EKS data OK, and get the data processed into one of the database. But then how? What it does, if one instance is receiving too much of traffic, the ELB will try to route the traffic elsewhere first. It knows there is an algorithm. It can it can monitor the traffic 
and the load of each of these instances in its network. Whichever it has been configured for. It has been configured for all these instances, so it can monitor the health of each and every instance and it can decide which. Which server it will have to divert the traffic to. Without the elastic load balancer, one would need a dedicated delegator, dedicated delegated inst instance to achieve similar results. And this is much more costlier than implementing ELB because you have to have a dedicated delegated. So for each instance, you will have a, dele a dedicated delegator and that is not a feasible solution. So you need to have an elastic load balancer and elastic means it can keep on. Uh, scaling up and down. Without any load balancing at all, you would need to manually and automatically distribute users. EKS data submitters am amongst listeners, so you have to do it manually. How will you do it? Or you have to write some scripts and those are not very, uh, very simple things to do. So why don't you go for an easier path? Take a service from e uh, ECS uh, from sorry. AWS. Uh, go for a load balancer and just implement a load balancer into your application. DynamoDB. This is uh, a database service that is you can go for it. That means this is a no SQL database fully managed. You do not have to do anything much more much than you give it and everything on the dynamo. You just have to configure a bit. On the DynamoDB, that service. The rest will be taken care by the. It's a managed service. That's why it is called a managed service. The uh, ability to scale to extremely large data sets while maintaining predictable performance. So it is automatically managing a large database while the performance does not degrade. You have to go for uh, a service provided by AWS. If you have to do it manually or do it through scripts and uh, database application, uh, it can cost you a lot and maybe you are not getting the desired performance. So why do, don't you give it to the champion who can do it automatically for you? And there can be uh, a relational database service like, you know, RDBMS, RDBMS like Oracle, Sybase, Ingress. Uh, there are so many uh, MySQL, uh, Microsoft SQL Server, so many RDS available in the market, but you have to hire a database administrator. You have to have to have uh, developers who can develop on databases, have a quite good of knowledge on databases. Those are costly inputs. So instead, you go for a service provided by Amazon AWS, where all these features are completely there. For you to uh, for uh, for AWS to manage. You just set it up. That's all. And in our course also, we demonstrate how easy it is to just set up uh, RDS on AWS. And you will start instantly running with that. That uh, technology. You do not have to have much of a knowledge. And that's why these DevOps guys uh, have a knowledge of everything, but maybe not in depth, but they can talk, they can do, they can demonstrate to the developers, to the operations guy, to the testing team, what is what. They can assume a role of a mentor. Amazon VPC, you know, Amazon VPC. So what is that? It is the virtual private cloud. Without a virtual private cloud, you will not be able to uh, use the infrastructure as a service. Or a uh, uh, platform as a service or a software as a service. So it, this is the integral part of your. Uh, resource, this is the network resource that you must have to implement the cloud or to get the services of a cloud. Virtual private cloud gives you full control over your virtual networking environment. Everything is virtual, but yes, though it's virtual, your work is done virtually every, everywhere, but your real work is done. You must have in your region at least one VPC. 
and this will include resource placement, connectivity, security. All these things will be done automatically by the VPC. You just have to install it or implement it or use it. You do not need to maybe create one VPC. You can you can take up a, a default VPC which is available in your region. That's all as simple as that. Get started by setting up your VPC in the AWS Service Console. Next add resources that is Amazon Elastic Cloud Compute so the, you can create your servers on the cloud. You can create your um, um, uh, relational database service that is RDS instances. Finally, define how your VPC communicate with each other across accounts, availability zones, AWS regions. So this VPC is the backbone of your network. Network between the regions or inside the regions between the subnets. You see uh, a region will have VPC, of course, one default VPC. This is the virtual private cloud within one region. OK. You can have you can create one more or two more uh, VPCs according to your custom need in that region, but at least one will be there. Otherwise, you cannot work on this region. And then again, the region will be divided into availability zone. So that availability zone will be based on the VPC subnet. So this is one availability zone. And in this availability zone, there are two instances. Let's say the zone name is AZ1, AZ1. And there is another subnet called AZ2 availability zone. So in this, there are two instances. In this, there are two instances. How many instances total in this region? There are four. In the same VPC, there are four uh, EC2 instances, but they are distributed in the two availability zone. Similarly, in region two, there is one more VPC, default VPC, and there will be uh, one, two, this thing. So in between, you see there is an arrow key. So they can talk to each other over the same VPC. Or if you want to talk to different region, there is also a cross VPC. VPCs can communicate with each other across accounts, across accounts, across availability zones. So between the availability zones and also between the regions, these two regions, region one and region two can communicate with each other. Because you have a VPC communicate. Okay. Now, Elastic Beanstalk, as I as I told you, as I told you, Elastic Beanstalk overview, where you have a Java application. Your developers, you have paid the developers to develop a web application uh, over uh, over the web, some application code with some environment configuration. You upload that entire thing with the Java application over onto the Elastic Beanstalk. That's all. Then this is the part that you have to do. That's all. Everything rest of it will be automatically done by the Elastic Beanstalk. So this is a very, very important feature of uh, for the deployment feature of automatic deployment. How, what it is doing? Deploy and scale the web application. So once you put that into the, you have to configure this just from your part as a DevOps engineer or a cloud engineer, you will just need to uh, configure this Elastic bin stock onto the AWS cloud. And once that is set up, you put in any application over here, you want to deploy it. So underlying infrastructure, whether it will need how many EC2s, whether it will need an elastic so if you if you need only one ec2 based on the application complexity and the uh, magnitude of that application it will it will decide how many ec2s it will it will create ec2 means the instances the server if there are multiple instances for the same application to be hosted on multiple instances then you need a elastic load balancer all these things will be automatically done by the elastic bin stock as you have configured and then it will decide whether to add the auto scaling feature into your application 
So, and these are all dynamic, you know. These are all dynamic as the load goes on. So there will be an auto scaling uh, as a load of the traffic goes on. There will be an auto scaling and the auto scaling will scale up your EC2. That means from one, maybe it will go for two instances. And once there are two instances, it will impl implement the load balancer. So see, this is all dynamic in nature. What who is taking the decision? That elastic bin stock is taking the decision. So down the line, say if you have deployed an application today, can you not expect that your if your application is quite popular? So today there are uh, maybe uh, 5,000 users when you started. One year down the line, that number of users can go up to scale up to 1 million. So on one, at that point when it was 5,000 users, it was sufficient to have one instance. There was no need for elastic load balancer. This will decide on that. You can configure that on this. This Java application is not doing anything. Now, once one year later, when the when the number of users or the traffic has gone gone up huge, one million users, it can scale it up to three or four instances. Immediately, it will install a load balancer, which will which will have the uh, distribution uh, technology, or it 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 knows where to put in the traffic in whichever uh, instance where it is having a less load, and automatically the auto scaling feature will be uh, will be pressed into operation, because what was one year back is not the same scenario. So all these things, why elastic bin bin stock? Elastic Binstock is a service for deploying and scaling web applications and services. Upload your code and Elastic Binstock automatically handles the, the deployment. You see, your one of the big biggest nightmare is to how to deploy it. Whether you will have a cluster of uh, servers or you need a, a cluster of network, uh, all these things will be decided automatically for capacity provisioning, load balancing and auto scaling. To application also, it will the bin stock will also have a one responsibility to, to monitor the application. So one in many in one. So many services are there over in Elastic Bin Stock. That is the beauty. Okay. It can also provision S3 buckets depending on what is to be auto scaled. Amazon Cloud Watch, as I said, it is used for monitoring purpose, health, health monitoring. It will use cloud formation, cloud formation to create the Amazon EC2 instances automatically. Cloud formation, as I said, uh, you, you can create your Amazon EC, uh, S3. You can create your so basically you are coding the infrastructure through some template and you do not I, when I mean to say coding, it does not mean that you have to write a Java a Java code or a Python code. Nothing. No, nothing, nothing. Very, very simple. That's why it is many people are shifting over to cloud. OK, you code the infrastructure through a template and the template is given by AWS. So everything is provided by them. You, it will it will interactively ask you to configure it the right way. That's all. So you have created a code to infrastructure uh, your inf uh, to code your infrastructure. You can code your infrastructure with the cloud formation to create an S3 bucket. Uh, and you can create your EC2 instances without any sort of a uh, big knowledge know how. That is the advantage. So AWS cloud formation lets you model, provision and manage AWS and third party resources by treating infrastructure as a code. You code it through the template. And as, as I have told you, this is a very, very important functionality called IAM. Identity and access management. With AWS identity and access management, you can specify who or what can access services and resources in AWS. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, are you being able to 
uh, hear my voice and see me and see the screen? Because I have not inquired with you. Yes. For a, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'm be, because you know I am not being able to see you whether you are there or whether you are being able to see interact on the stuff. So do not hesitate to ask any questions. We are towards the end of the uh, presentation. So just give uh, have some patience with me and tolerate me for some more time. OK. So you see, I am a user. I am uh, I'm an administrator over the cloud, AWS cloud. I will not allow anyone and everyone to use my uh, important resources and the very, very critical resources over, over the cloud because my organization depends, my organization's profit, my organization's re uh, revenue, the processes will depend on the uh, performance of those re resources, accessibility and, uh, you know, scalability of those resources. So I should not allow anyone who, is, who does not have a requisite knowledge to to be able to tam tamper tamper with my uh, resources. So what I will do as a administrator, I will provide an identity and access management utility or service. I will give a fine grained permissions to it. So why fine grained? Because there are so many policies, so many privileges and combinations and permutations of those uh, privileges. You can combine this and that. So uh, uh, a person from accounts who is using my AWS resources should not go and tamper with my network, isn't it? Because he has nothing to do with the networking resources. So I will only give a fine grain, fine grain permission to that uh, user who is only meant to do the, uh, see he's from the accounts. He would like to know only the billing he, he needs to access only the billing portion of the you know, because he's more concerned with how much this month the bill has come and what are the resources and what are the justifications and he is an expert to understand that bill provided by amazon so why should i give that user unnecessary permissions and policy to access other resources he doesn't have any any purpose any job with them okay uh, did I make any sense? So that's why you have to apply it. So workforce users and workloads with IEM. So who are those? Who can access what? This is what is determined by IEM, uh, Identity and Access Management. So that user can access permissions with IEM policy. So I will give IAM policy permission with that user. So with that, with the help of the, those policies and permissions, the resource, the, the user can access the resources within our AWS organization. Like if I say what is what is getting built as a policy, you are saying that you. You as a user, uh, as an IEM user, I I'm a developer, OK, and I need an access to the Lambda function. Lambda function is a distributed function, so I would it's a very sophisticated function. So as a developer, I would need an access to this resource the, uh, I, I should be able to create a Lambda, Lambda function. So what I'm doing as an administrator, I'm giving a statement. I'm creating a statement and saying that uh, what is the operation? The service ID the service ID is to create a function. Uh, what is the effect? I am giving this effect to allow this user to create a function. So this is a part of the policy. I'm creating a policy. If I have not created a policy or a permission policy for this user, whenever the user is trying to create a Lambda function, it will get an error access denied. Lambda create function determined? No. This user, though it's a developer, so the, the developer will come up with the to the administrator and say, sir, I'm getting an access denied error. I'm not being able to create a Lambda function. So what the administrator will do will give a fine gain policy to this user saying that allow create function utility for the action to create a Lambda function. You see Lambda 
create from this is a json type of data json json means javascript object notation i'm not going to the details but you see this is the key and this is the value key colon value pair so i'm giving a json type of policy data and i'm allowing uh, the create function utility for lambda so the action is to lambda and that lambda creation can be applied on all the resources you see i have given resource star star means all so this lambda function to create a lambda function on any of the resources is allowed for this particular user once this has been uh, applied onto that user that im user will now be able to create a lambda function on any resource and therefore this error will not be happening is that clear uh i thought maybe i should be able to uh, give you a hands on on how i create an ec2 instance i have listed down the steps so in our main course uh, we will of, of course we will uh, we will know how to do and there are lots of many things but today there is not enough time to actually give you a hands on demonstration on how to create an instance over the cloud and how to get it connected from your laptop from windows or mac laptop okay but yes uh, i can just go through the steps a bit without actually demonstrating it like you have to log into your amazon console as an im user as any user who has resources access to the resource okay we must select an aws region on which i would like to create like in in my diagrams and in discussion earlier you have seen definitely an a server can be created in a region in a particular availability zone in a particular subnet invoke aws ec2 compute service now this is one wizard so we can select a launch instance wizard so we there is a wizard in the aws console uh, through which i can create my ec2 instance that is some wizard which will guide me through to the installation process select the various elements for creation of ec2 instance like we will i will have to uh, select the ami what is ami amazon machine image what is that that is the operating system i will select a linux operating system for Uh, operating on my ec2 instance i need a key pair for authentication there is no password authentication you know uh, when, when you log into a server and right now you may be logging into some server some some application that you might be using and they might ask you the username and the password but when you go to a cloud instance like ec2 instance of aws you cannot log in with a password you can log in but that is not safe password is not at all safe anymore anybody can hack your password so you go by the fingerprint authentication fingerprint your fingerprint cannot be matched with any other fingerprint anywhere of the any so there are so many billions and billions of uh, p, uh, human being on the earth no two human being will have the same key pair or the fingerprint you will have the security group which is like the uh you will try not to allow any any traffic without the rule set so it's sort of sudden sort of, sort of security that you are implementing with that ec2 instance you are attaching some volume like 8 gb or 20 gb of uh, storage space instance type that means you are defining what type of instance it is it is whether it's a big instance or a small instance or a, a micro instance okay uh, what is the vpc that you select so you must select uh, the vpc you may create a vpc of your own or you can go for a default vpc of that region there must be one default vpc for that region and also you can either create the subnets or better if you can select a default subnet for, to start with i do not need to go into the complexity make my my life simpler by selecting all this already ready made for you these are already available for that region so select that because an instance will be created on a particular subnet on a particular availability zone of that region region 
is by VPC and subnets will denote the availability zone. You review and submit. That means whatever you see, whatever you finally have a review and then uh, submit. You will create a session. Oh, so the instance will be created that AWS EC2 instance will be created. Now, you if you are using Windows. You will use putty to connect to that instance. If you are using Mac OS, you will use terminal to connect your terminal to connect to your uh, EC2 instance. That way uh, you, uh, you, uh, you have to convert the PEM file. We will discuss that in, in details when we do the main course. It's a very, very interesting subject. You cannot say uh, avoid it. So that is all for today. I think, I hope and I assume that it was a fantastic. I mean, your understanding at least uh, whatever little you had, uh, this is a bit more and it will grow more and more and more as you stay along with us. OK, thank you very much.